This week's presentation, The Shamanic Worldview, presented by Gail Park. Over many thousands of years, our ancestors, de ancestors developed ways of expanding human capacity for healing and problem solving. The systems and practices they originated came to be called shamanism. Gail will talk about how shamans and shamanic cultures view and interact with our earth and its inhabitants, both the physical and the supernatural, and the ancient tools and practices they still use to serve their tribe. Gail Park is a writer, artist, and mystic who has explored various forms of spirituality since her youth. For the past 17 years, she has studied and practiced shamanism and druidry. Among her early shamanic teachers were an 11th generation Siberian shaman, a Native American ceremonialist, and a Peruvian Peruvian She is currently studying with a Peruvian teacher, and we look forward to hearing her speak. Please welcome. Shamanism, not as a historical curiosity, but as a living thing. Uh, one thing I want to do first, though, is I, I, I would like to, to maybe do some ceremonies and stuff on here as a public thing. And last time I spoke here, I, di I didn't uh, tell people that I would put a, a clipboard over underneath the tree. So if you want to be notified if I decide to do something, then you could sign up your email, name and email address under the tree. So now I've said that, and I won't forget it again. So, anyway, my wish today is to just expand your understanding of this particular subject and give you some ways to incorporate it into your own life to make your life richer and deepen your connection with Mother Earth. First, I'll say not all shaman shamanistic traditions are the same. Different cultures have somewhat different symbolism and different ways of doing their ceremonies. I'll talk about what's been come, come to be called core shamanism, which is the shamanic practices that most shamanic cultures have in common. And a little bit about what I've learned personally. Uh, in describing shamanism, we can infer, infer things about how the tribe operates and what it believes and still believe and believes still. So what is shamanism? Well, Michael Harner, who's an anthropologist and uh, one of the, uh, he studied shamanic cultures all his life and, and now he's justifiably recognized for, uh, as a leader in preservation and revival of shamanic traditions in many places in the world. There. I have died out somewhat due to other influences. Uh, he says, over tens of thousands of years, our ancient ancestors all over the world discovered how to maximize human abilities of mind and spirit for healing and problem solving. The remarkable system of methods they developed is today known as shamanism, a term that comes from a Siberian tribal word for its practitioners, shamans. Shamans are a type of medicine man or woman especially distinguished by the use of journeys to hidden worlds, otherwise mainly known through myth, dream, and near-death experiences. Nicholas Wood, in the Book of the Shaman, defines shamanism this way. A shaman can be broadly defined as a person of either sex who can perceive the world of spirits, and by entering a trance, journey to other realities to communicate with their inhabitants and to gain spiritual knowledge. Shamanism is not like a religion in that it doesn't focus on faith. It focuses on experience. Shamans don't believe in spirits. They interact with them every day. Especially, uh, and during special times of seeking, 
They hear them, they talk to them, they pray to them. They know that their spirits, like we know, will have some story. Shamanism is a spirituality that springs from a person's own knowledge of the world and individual experience of spirit. There is no creed or dom uh, doctrine, dogma attached. It may be the oldest type of spirituality that's existed for thousands of years from the Neolithic era of core. A shamans can be thought of as mediators or bridges between the spirit world and the natural world. Although shamans are chosen or called by different methods and different traditions, they don't seek contact with the spirit world for themselves alone. They do it for the community. They help their tribe by performing healings, cleansing individuals for the tribe of wrong spirits or imbalances, doing rituals or ceremonies to honor rites of passage, such as birth, puberty, marriage, and death, to assure a good hunt or a good harvest. They may be the recorders of the passage of time, readers of signs in nature and the spirit world to give direction for the future, and performers of offerings and ceremonies. Someone may perform all of these services, or they may become known for ones that they're particularly adept at. And people will kind of say, well, you know, if you have a broken limb, there's a particular shaman that can be within reach that you might want to go to for that. Uh, shamans may live a life of honor amongst their tribe, more or less participating in the normal life of the tribe, or in some cultures they're viewed with fear because they deal with realities outside the norm. They live apart and are sought out only by people who need their help. As in all religions and types of spirituality, there are individuals who enjoy their power over much, they use it for personal gain rather than the benefit of the community. In some traditions, individuals who use their powers to influence people and events in unethical and harmful ways are known as sorcerers or black magicians. <laughs> These people are definitely feared. Sometimes they are hired to create mischief by a person seeking revenge on someone or a misguided individual who wants to bend another person to their will. Probably in talking about the shamanic worldview, the, probably the most important thing to remember is that shamans know that all creation is alive. Each created thing has a spirit or an essence, and those spirits have messages and help for us. Actually, they don't just know that as a mental construct, but they're deeply, profoundly aware of life and the energy that exists in all creation, whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral. For instance, we don't commonly think about rocks as being alive. But long shamanic tradition holds that rocks are keepers of memory. I always think about that when I go to the Grand Canyon and look at the striations of rock. And they say when you look to the bottom that the rocks down there are a million years old. What stories they could tell. I also think of it when I look at petroglyphs and cave paintings. I imagine ancient people adding their memories to the face of the rock, so that the rock can keep those memories too. Shamans from many traditions around the world have used and honored quartz crystals, very prevalent, aware of their ability to store and transmit energy thousands of years before modern science put them to use in computer chips. When shamans were passing into a new territory, they might be guided to pick up a certain rock to learn about the history of an area. There's actually even a shamanic technique for getting messages from, from a rock. Scientists have repeatedly shown that plants respond to stimuli and appear to have feelings. They can appreciate music and anticipate pain. They seem to suffer when their companions are hurt or uprooted. As I learned to tune into the plant world, I was surprised, really, to find that the plant's vibration was in many cases higher than humans. Than most humans, I should say. I, <laughs> I came to appreciate that they generously share their life force with us. I began to see how interdependent we are. It was a revelation to see that I inhaled what the trees exhaled, and they inhaled what I exhaled. 
we are breathing together. And I'd like to take just a moment now to draw your attention to this truth. The one that we sit under every Sunday, not every Sunday here. And uh, basically, if you would take, take just a moment and just notice that tree, what it does for us, the atmosphere it provides, what it would be like if it weren't here. And breathe with it for just a moment. Scientists believe that all kinds of beings are equal. Shamans believe, pardon me, uh, and must be respected. A shaman considers that we're all made of the same star stuff, which apparently science upholds. To the shaman, we're all related in our common origin and participation in the spirit of life. We all have a part to play in the grand scheme of things. The rocks and the trees and the animals and the birds are our kin. They have their own kinds of intelligence, and they all have value. We're very species-centric. We think that the whole world is created for us. And, and we take from it without even thinking many times. In the shamanic view, every act has to be performed with respect and gratitude. They wouldn't kill an animal for food or cut down a tree or pick an herb without praying, without talking to it, thanking it for its gift, and maybe leaving a small token of gratitude. They live in a kind of awareness that we have lost. We're so removed even from our sources of food that few of us would think to thank the cow that lost its life to give us that hamburger. It came in a package, the killing already done for us. It was an anonymous cow, undifferentiated, unknown. But it enjoyed the sun and the green grass and the companionship of its kind, and its life was precious to it. Do we think that, do we think to thank the trees that shade our house and keep us cooler in the summer, the pet that so devotedly loves us? like sing a song, say a prayer, or make an offering to honor their sacrifice. And the offerings might dip from culture to culture. Pardon me, I got some stuff up there. <laughs> Native Americans usually offer tobacco and cornmeal. Tobacco representing the male and cornmeal usually representing the female vibrations. In Europe, milk, beer, honey, and little small cakes, honey cakes sometimes were used as offerings. If you were offering to the fairies, you might offer oatmeal and Irish whiskey. In Mexico and Central America, gold, turquoise, jade, flowers, and maize flour are common offerings. Shamans usually have special tools like drums and rattles and staffs and shields and fans and crystals and maybe ceremonial garments that help them to fix their focus or intent in a ceremony. And the spirit represented by these objects or talismans help the shaman to achieve her objective. Shamanic tools are made out of natural materials such as fur, bones, feathers, stones, crystals, dried plants. Shaman may get her tools left for her in nature. They may be given to her by another shaman, or she may be instructed in how to make her own by her healthy spirits. Shamans have special relationships with spirit helpers and in many cultures, primarily animals. Shamans often get their power animals or animals that work with them by making a special journey to other dimensions to find them. Or they might have a very powerful encounter with an animal in a physical form that is, uh, reveals a special relationship. Among the shamanic tools, may be symbols of his or her connection to their power animals. For example, if one of the shaman's helpers is the spirit of a bear, 
or bear in his medicine bag with shamanic tools. He may have a bear skin or a bear claw to help him draw on the qualities of a bear. He may paint a bear on his shield, or she may carry a bear in her medicine bag by carving wood or chipping stone into a likeness. So what benefit would that have? Different animals have different strengths and characteristics and qualities that they can share with us. Bear is considered to be kin to humans because it can stand upright and walk like a person does. Legends talk about how humans have turned into bears and bears into humans and bears into gods. The bear even has a constellation named for it, of course, Ursa Major, the great bear. In many traditions, the bear is a healing spirit and because it sleeps all winter, it is also associated with the power of dreaming in the subconscious mind. It may symbolize withdrawal from ordinary activities to seek wisdom from the subconscious of the spirit world. So, how can a bear spirit help you? One way might be to help you meditate or to go within to find the causes of emotional and mental imbalance or disturbance and provide healing energy to help you release them or to remind you to tend to your inner source of power. Obviously, a powerful predator, a bear could be a protector spirit. <clears throat> eagle is another example of an animal guide. Every society that's had contact with eagles has some mystic symbolism attached to them. And if not eagles, then to other large birds. Eagles are commonly linked with access to great spirit and acute long-range vision. The ability to look into the future, a visionary spirit. The Pueblo Indians say that the eagle flies so high that he flies through a hole in the sky to great spirit, and he can bring back messages and wisdom for us. They're widely considered to be messengers from heaven and symbols of the sun. In Mexico, as you may know, the ancient Aztecs were told that they should stop and settle where they saw an eagle standing on a cactus eating a snake. And that is actually where they did settle, Mexico City, I believe. And uh, I, the, some, those symbols are on the flag. Eagle feathers are revered as tools for healing, cleansing the aura, and accessing great spirit. You might ask for help from ego when you need to make a decision that will affect your life for a long time, or when you want to elevate yourself above earthly difficulties and take things from a broader perspective, take the long-range view. The drum is known as the shaman's horse because he rides its vibration to other worlds. They, uh, shamans may make their own drums according to his according to instructions from their spirit guides. Um, they might tell them what wood to use, what kind of skin to stretch over it, uh, how it should be decorated. All of these components have a symbolism that allows, that, that gives the shaman more connection. Scientifically speaking, researchers have found that after about 12 minutes of drumming, particularly at the rate of 47 beats per second, our brain waves synchronize with the drum beat. And this car, this, this level, 47 beats per second, is, uh, corresponds with the rhythms experienced in sleep or moderate to deep meditative or trance states. Rattles are used for journeying, for calling spirits, and for healing ceremonies. They can be made out of natural materials such as seed pods, rawhide, shaped rawhide, gourds, turtle shells, Smudge sticks, you may all be familiar with that, even those of you who don't have any exposure to this, uh, are made of sacred herbs, such as sage and cedar, juniper, copal, you don't put that in a stick, but it, it's uh, another thing, it's used to call spirits, it's a sweet smell. Or to, and these things can use, be used to clear the environment, or to call spirits, or to take prayers to the great spirit on the smoke. Small bundles of, of uh, earth are lit with fire, and sometimes the smoke is fanned with a feather, or sometimes it's just blown in the direction that you want to cleanse or purify. 
cleansing smudge made from the more pungent herbs can clear your aura or your area of confusion and imprints of people you've been around or situations you've been in. It's something you do to your house every day, particularly if you have some uh, sort of negative influence coming in regularly. <laughs> Uh, and I know some of you probably do. <laughs> it, can, it can be used to clear rooms or other spaces of negative imprints for people who are angry, sad, or sick. Shamans may use other tools such as special robes or clothing, jewelry, staffs, crystals, heather, feathers, hide, bones, bells, whistles. Shamanic journeying is, is probably, as you know from the introduction, but the, the travel to other worlds, it's a travel to consciousness, uh, is probably the um, major shamanic practice. Most shamanic traditions believe that there are three worlds. There's the underworld, the middle world, and the upper world. And the underworld is not like the Christian conception of hell or anything like that. It's a, it's a place that uh, you might find power animals and, and you might find fairies, and there's even a place there that they call the land of the dead. But a shaman wouldn't normally go to the land of the dead without a reason. They, you know, he might go to help someone find their way, or to find someone who went there by mistake, you know, and bring them back. Uh, let's see, uh, the middle world would be parallel to this world. It would be almost like a, a shadow of this world. And it would be... Uh, it, the, it's like an etheric version. Uh, shamans might travel in this world to find lost objects, to spy on the tribe's enemies, uh, to uh, work with the spirit of the elements, like maybe a feature, land feature like a mountain. The upper world is often seen of a place like sky and clouds, uh, of sky and clouds. It may be inhabited with beings that are more human-like, more like angels or spiritual teachers or ascended masters would be readily found in the upper world. And one's not considered better than the other, they're just different. Most shamans enter other worlds through a trance induced by the drum or another per percussion instrument. In about 10% of shamanic cultures, they use mind-altering drugs. You may have heard of, uh, you know, peyote, ayahuasca, it's different, different traditions. Some people do use it, but it's not nearly as prevalent as a lot of people think. Uh, shamanic journey might have something like this. A drummer starts a drum beat, shaking a rattle or something. A uh, shaman flies down on his back with his eyes covered. Each shaman has a special place like an animal den or a cave or an underground underwater spring or something that he'll use in, in, the, in the shadow consciousness to go through to reach the underworld. And it's good to have a place that exists in earthly reality because it kind of demarks the step that you're taking from the physical world to the middle world as it's understood spiritually. Uh, the journeyer calls upon his power animal and steps through. And when he, he, may, he may encounter something like a tunnel and he may go fast or he may go slow, but he wind up and it, the thing finally opens out into another dimension. And that may look similar to what you might see here on Earth. And his power animals would normally be waiting there for him. To, he would state his purpose, what he's, what he's trying to find, what he's trying to learn, to his power animal, and his power animal would guide him to the spot where that might be found. And animals are particularly good at this because they know the landscape. The shaman, after he arrives at the destination, he might talk to people or ancestors or ascended masters or other animal or nature spirits. And when, when he's ready to return to ordinary a, a reality, he takes his power animal, takes him back to where he came in, to this reality, and he follows the same path back up, accompanied by rapid drumbeat. He thanks his power animal in that process somewhere. Now, I'll not, uh, I'll not say that it's strictly necessary to use a drum. There are many ways to 
consider a, a trance state or, a, or some kind of state where you're open to these kinds of encounters. But uh, one, of the, one of the main healing techniques that's used that, that's an example of how they might use shamanic journeying in another way is uh, what they call soul retrieval. Uh, trauma, abuse, and loss, they feel can break pieces off of a person's soul. And these pieces recede or go hide someplace because they can't stand the intensity of the feeling here. Uh, and that weakens a person and makes them more susceptible to illness or to the intrusion of negative spirits. The shaman might make a soul retrieval journey to recover these missing pieces and bring them back. So that would restore power and wholeness to the person that he made the journey for, give them, a, give them that strength back. And uh, a few other ceremonies that are pretty typical, some of these are, are mostly Native American indigenous and Northern Native American indigenous, some of them not. Uh, in the Northern tradition, vision quests, they usually involve three or four days of fasting and prayer in a wilderness setting. And the name of this particular ceremony, it comes from a Sioux phrase that means he cried for a vision. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I once worked part-time as a tour guide in Sedona, Arizona when I first moved there, uh, taking people around to the vortexes and doing little ceremonies with them. The lady I worked for, uh, also offered uh, what she called a night vigil, which is a shortened version of the vision quest. You just go out for one night. You spend the night out in the wilderness. Uh, this particular time, she asked me to go with her because she had some elderly, an elderly couple from New York City was coming. They wanted to go out on the land overnight. Well, she thought she might need help, so she asked me if I'd come, and she packed the van up and, you know, the sleeping stuff and things that we need. And we we got out into the wilderness. It was on, on one of the high mesas above Sedona. Uh, it was, a, it was uh, about 7,000 feet elevation, so it was going to get fairly cool during the night. It was in the fall. Uh, these folks were ready to, ready to do this, and I had a lot of respect for them for giving it a try because of their limitations. He could barely walk, oh, pardon me, he could barely walk. And so he could only walk, when we parked the van, we, he could only walk out a little way and set up his place. And then he found he couldn't lie down. So he had to go back to the van and get a chair, a lawn chair to sit in. His wife kept fixed her place about 100 yards away at the edge of a wood. And in each case, they have their little circle of sticks outlining their sacred space, and there was a whole little procedure that they were to go through to make this space safe and sacred. Um, I went to get something to sleep in, and it turned out that Suzanne had not packed enough stuff. She packed two sleeping bags instead of four. And <laughs> I searched around in the van and found a piece of tarp that I could lie on, and a plastic poncho to cover myself up with. And Suzanne slept in the van with one little thin blanket on her. I walked around the sort of, uh, met through this meadow and around the, around the corner, so to speak, to where I would be out of sight, but I could hear them if they called for me. Uh, I threw down my little cart and put my little poncho over me, and, and I don't know, the night was cold, and it's clear, it was full of stars. Owls hooted, elk called to each other in high pitched cries and bellows. Dark shapes flew by, rustling rock thoughts of dangerous animals, and rattlesnakes that might try to get in our beds to get warm. <coughs> this mini quest was far from a full native style, but in our sharing experiences the next morning, it was obvious that it was illuminating. Both the elderly man and I had seen medicine wheels in the stars. We had become acquainted with the animals of the night. We had faced primal fears, usually kept suppressed, and transcended discomfort in order to reach 
for greater spiritual understanding. Nancy Wheel is another favorite of mine. It's a design based on a circle and a cross, and, it, and it's used in many cultures to create sacred space and to remind them of, of many things. In America, in the Americas, it's used generally built of, of stones in a circle. The, the cross in the center of the circle is called the equal arm cross. It's not like a Jesus cross. It indicates the four directions, the four elements, the four seasons. Uh, the medicine wheel works with nature energies and symbolism to help seekers find insight and guidance. A medicine wheel is not just a symbol of the sacred, it's used sometimes as a sacred place, to an altar, more or less, for spiritual work, the big altar that you can get in. Sweat lodges were and still are used in many, many cultures for purification and prayer. Sometimes sweating precedes a ceremony like a vision quest and serves as preparation for important spiritual work. It's usually constructed of, in the northern part, anyway. It's constructed of, of 12 bent saplings over which they would throw uh, blankets or skins. And in the center of the thing of this dome is a fire pit. Uh, stones are handed through into the center of the fire pit, and, and the leader of the ceremony will sprinkle water or water and herbs onto the fire. And they do it in four rounds and with a little breather in between. And uh, the, uh, it, it's like being in the womb of Mother Earth and the total darkness and dampness. Pipe ceremonies, and again, in the northern tradition more than here, I think, uh, the sacred, sacred pipe is really a portable altar. And we won't go into the symbolism of each part, but it does have it. The pipe is loaded with tobacco, and the pipe carrier uh, acknowledges the four directions by pointing with the stem of the pipe, and then touches the ground onto the earth, and then points to the sky to acknowledge Father Sky, and then straight up to acknowledge Great Spirit. Smoke from the pipe represents the smoker's visible breath, truthful words, truthful actions, and a truthful spirit. That's why in the old Western movies, the Indians always wanted to smoke the pipe after they made a treaty. But unfortunately, the white man didn't get the symbolism. <laughs> Dancing is part of many shamanic traditions. Dancing can be a form of prayer or setting a tent. Some shamans dance to the point of exhaustion to, as a method of going into trance. Physical exertion was and still is used as a way to prove sincerity and offer energy to the spirits in prayer or in repayment of gifts. It can be used as a connection with power animal by dancing the animal, which is basically merging into the animal spirit and allowing it to dance through you and with you. And in that way you honor it and allow it to have the pleasure of experiencing expression in physical form. So I think I've covered some of the basics of how shamanism is practiced in other cultures. So I'd like to suggest a few simple ways that you could bring more shamanic awareness into your life. You could create an altar made with natural materials, candles, sacred art, whatever you feel Guide it to include, you might include something to represent the four elements of air, earth, water, and fire. <coughs> you could use this as a place to do daily prayers or meditation or just to remember to honor the earth. You might take on the, the, the idea of smudging your house or yourself. I do it when I'm feeling unclear, confused. Uh, you could clear negativity that way from, from your life more and more. Uh, you can reflect on times and places when you've had a special connection to nature. Animals, plants, seas, mountains, forests. Ask yourself what they symbolized to you or how they made you feel. I'm sure you all, or those of you who are able, like to take a walk now and then. When you're walking in nature, really notice all the life around you. My hair is blowing in my mouth. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and be open to receive messages in nature. The main reason you don't get them is because you don't look for them and you don't ask. Take a walk in nature and really notice the life around you. Try to be open to the messages in nature. Notice the animals you feel most drawn to and reflect on their qualities. Then you might think about animals that you're not particularly drawn to and what their qualities might be. If you were able to share with them, what would you like for them to share with you? You could be an example. You could treat the earth and its creatures with respect and encourage others to do the same. You could make simple offerings in places of power for you, places where you've had significant experiences or where you feel a special spiritual presence. Thank the plants and trees for their blessing. Remember where your food comes from and be thankful for it. You might consider living more simply, both for spiritual clarity and for Earth's well-being. I'll, I'd like to conclude with an excerpt from the chapter for All My Relations, which comes from uh, Mother Earth Spirituality book by Ed Nagaha, who is known as Eagle Man. The plight of the non-Indian world is that it's lost respect for Mother Earth, from whom and where we all come. We all start out in this world as tiny seeds, no different from our animals, brothers and sisters. The deer, the bear, the buffalo, or the trees, the flowers, the winged people. Every particle of our body comes from the good things Mother Earth has put forth. Mother Earth is our real mother because every bit of us truly comes from her. And daily she takes care of us. The tiny seed takes on the minerals and the waters of Mother Earth. It is fueled by Wiyo, the sun, and given a spirit by Wakon Tonka. This morning at breakfast we took from Mother Earth's live, as we have done every day of our lives. But did we thank her for giving us the means to live? The old Indian did. When he drove his horse in close to a buffalo, running at full speed across the prairie, he drew his bowstring back, and as he did so, said, Forgive me, brother, but my people must live. After he butchered the buffalo, he took the skull and placed it toward the setting sun as a thanksgiving and acknowledgement that all things come from Mother Earth. He brought the meat back to camp, and gave it first to the old, the withered, and the weak. For thousands of years, the great herd thrived across the continent because the Indian never took more than he needed. Today, the buffalo is gone. You say ecology. We think the words Mother Earth have deeper meaning. If we wish to survive, we must respect her. Our survival is dependent on the realization that Mother Earth is a truly holy being, that all things in the world are holy, we must not be violated, and that we must share and be generous with one another. So now, as a benediction, I'll use a Lakota Sioux phrase that's often used at the close of ceremonies to express the kinship we have with nature and all created things. Mataki Oahu, which means for all my relations. If you would raise your hand, the mic will be brought to you, and then if you would stand up, hold the mic really close to your mouth, that's the way it works best, and ask a question. We're interested more in questions than we are comments, though I know it's intriguing to give comments. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, would you mind sharing with us uh, your personal experience you've had that was really memorable for you? Oh, gosh. It would take me minutes to sort through there. Uh, seems like something happens every day. <laughs> well, this is not, you know, particularly, you wouldn't think of it's no big shamanic deal, you wouldn't think. But what comes to me is, is something that happened recently, probably because it was recent. <laughs> and, uh, I was uh, at the Tuesday market, which I love, and I was there with a friend and uh, a neighbor, and someone walked up, well, first I should tell you, I was walking through the uh, tables and I saw someone's keys lying on the corner of the table. 
And I pointed it out to the vendor, and I said, someone's left their keys. And he, he picked them up and held them, and I, and I was thinking, oh, God, that's terrible. I mean, this person's going to not go, he's going to be hunting for those keys all over this place. And I felt so sorry for him. And, uh, and so my friend and I were sitting at this table, and we chatted for a little while, and uh, she got up to leave. And for some reason or another, I just had to say about those keys. And uh, she, she said, oh, my God. She was looking at her person. She said, they were her keys. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little recent thing that happened. <laughs> but things like that happen more and more, it seems to me. And as far as, uh, you know, like things that you would consider a more of a traditional shamanic nature, I, I've had many, many experiences with uh, in shamanic journeys that are deep. And, and I'm particularly fond of dream work myself. And dreams that have, you know, have come true and that have deep symbolism. It's something that actually has helped me on my spiritual path is to take dreams and, and write them down and work on you know, interpretations of them over time. It's helped me a lot to understand who I am and what I really think about. <laughs> what's on my mind deeper down. Yes, I guess uh, my question is, uh, are you familiar with the movie Avatar? Yes, I love and, it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess would that be if someone would be interested in shamanism, is that kind of a basic philosophy that exists in that movie? That, that yeah. The earth that, that would give you a, a real good understanding? Because I guess from what I've heard you say, that would be... That would be a primary thing, that understanding that... that that everything is alive, that's very prevalent in that movie, but that's a good example. Thank you. Hello. Must stand up. Uh, a question about the power animal. Uh, you mentioned that with your power animal, you would use something that from, the, from that animal, like a bear claw or mm -hmm. a turtle shell. And how do you equate, I see that as kind of a, a, a dead thing, like a piece of that animal that's right. died. So how do you equate using that as, well, uh, the animal had to die, it uh, could be that. I so. understand what you're saying, yeah. and I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a vegan. And, you know, so I, there, there are two things in my house that have leather. The one I want to drum, and the other one, is, which I made myself, and I don't feel like I'm supposed to get rid of it. But the other one was a little red leather wallet that a loving cousin gave to me. And, and the gulf between us was so wide that the gesture, I keep it in my purse because I love to look at it. But I, I, I tend to, I have a feather or two, but I, just ones I picked up along the road. And other than that, I don't use any animal at all. Lots. <laughs> Several. Oh, here, Kevin. Anybody? Oh, there you go. Oh, back in the gazebo. Hi. Hi. Can you help me understand a little bit more about smudging? Uh huh. Sure. Um, you can you can find smudge sticks here and there. Uh, in in the United States, there lots of times they're white sage, and and what you do it's a little bundle with a little string wrapped around it. I make them for myself. But I don't have white sage, but I raise things in my yard to make these little sage sticks from. And you, you wrap them with a thread or a, a little thin piece of yarn or something, it's, it's going to burn. So you like the end of it, and you, and you like if you wanted to uh, clear your house, you would just go through and just wave it around, blow it, uh, do a little prayer with it, you know, state your intention to cleanse and purify, maybe remove any negative spirits, or if you want, a, if you want a, a place that's just for you to move anybody else's spirit, whether you like them or don't like them, you know, but you can, just with a little intention and with the blowing of the sage or whatever, you can cleanse. You'll, you'll notice a difference, I think, what, when you do it. Okay. What's your understanding of the um, fireworks which have uh, punctuated your talk? I mean, I've heard that... Uh, that's to frighten away the evil spirits, but that seems to too easy. I've, I've heard that too. I'm sure that there are other other things associated with it, and, and I honestly don't know all of what goes on in this culture. I've 
set it and set myself a task to learn. But uh, yes, they are supposed to frighten away the devil. The boom, you know. <laughs> the boom ones, particularly. Hello, thank so, you. Um, can you speak if you've had any personal experience working with illness shamanically, and if not, maybe just comment a bit on their general view? Uh -huh. Well, uh, as I mentioned, the, they consider largely that that one of the things that creates illness is soul loss. Those pieces that break off and go somewhere else when you when you suffer a trauma or an injury or a severe illness or the loss of of something significant to you. That's one thing that they do is do the journey to bring back that strength, back that piece of you to try to make you whole again. Uh, basically, I did the ceremony the other day for uh, a friend of mine who has had uh, Hodgkin's disease or something. She, she, uh, she's been very sick and she's had to go through a lot of medical stuff and, and I felt guided to do uh, seven ceremonies for her. And I've got two more to go. I haven't been told when to do them yet. But uh, basically, I did them until I saw her aura light up. And this was a distance thing. I think I might be better at that, actually, uh, distance healing. Uh, you, can, you can take people to a sacred spot and use sacred objects and place around them and drum and rattle. And, and some people use their hands like to create a kind of a cleansing or an energizing of what would be the equivalent of the Eastern Indian chakra system. You know, the, the points in your body where you receive and generate energy, they might do this sort of thing until they feel a change in the temperature or the feeling of the, the aura there and to locate an illness. And then they might do something like that. Use, some of them are experts in herbs. You know, they use herbal medicine as well as this particular spiritual sort of approach to it. And they might lie the person down and just have, and just work on them that way until they feel some sort of change or break. And then uh, it may have to be repeated. Sometimes, sometimes it's recommended that, that you may have to do a healing ceremony ten times because it takes a while to, to get through to some, more, more to some people than others. Some people you can feel they're up very open and, and you know, they really want it. <laughs> and, and so it goes quicker. But, uh, that, is that, is that sort of answer your question? Other questions? Over here? Oh. A great many of our uh, spiritual paths, religions you might call them, uh, relate to, uh, use the words God, Allah, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if in your experience of shamanism there is a, a similar term you might apply, or if you, even if there's a part of a belief mm -hmm. of a higher power or source or such. Yeah. Uh, the, I've heard it called, you know, obviously the, the Native Americans in the northern, north of the border call it the great spirit, largely. But I've also heard it called the great mystery. Uh, sometimes the words that are used for the sun also can, be mean, can mean God. In this tradition that I'm studying now, there's a, a central uh, sort of place in the altar that represents that sort of uh, alignment. And it's called Kuiti. So but that's not a word for God necessarily, but it's a word for that that sort of vertical input to us and, and access upward. Do you use uh, therapeutic oils in your practice? No, I don't. Uh, I use them. Uh, I make kind of like a, another thing that you can use for smudging. I use, uh, I use essential oils of different types to, and dilute them with water so that so that they won't they won't say anything and flip them, you know, as, as another way of cleansing or making an offering to an area. I have some that smells really good. I have this enormous altar at home. It's like <laughs> and it's full of stuff. And so I you know, put this beautiful smell as kind of an offering to the spirits that 
continually help me and encourage me and keep me on track. <laughs> so that's that's the thing that I do do with essential oils, but I don't use it in my. In, I don't really practice it anymore. I just do it when I want to. <laughs> but, but I would like to do some ceremonies and stuff like that here, like maybe say a winter solstice ceremony or something like that. Then you know that could open to the public or something. If I could figure out a way to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing your coffee cups, your wonderful open hearts, and mine. Please stab your chair, throw away anything that you've accumulated that's so available. And you can take your conversation outside.